Hello, Penguin Arts, I'm the Bitty Penguin, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Beyond Kerbal. In the previous episode, we visited the wasteland's moon of Malice, and now we have no further use for our lander. So, we're going to crash the Miranda into the surface in an attempt to try and get some science from all of these seismometers that we placed across the surface. However, in a bid to try and keep the part count of this whole mission down, I didn't put a probe core on the Miranda, so we actually have to use Lemor Kerman to put it onto a suborbital trajectory and then leap out of it while it's crashing towards the surface and get ourselves back towards Constellation. A little bit of a daredevil maneuver and certainly not the only one you're going to be seeing from Lemor in this episode, but we get him safely back to the spacecraft, get him into our sovereign SSTO, and now we can watch Miranda plummet towards the surface. Yeah, I mean, if we didn't have any further use for this, we weren't going to land on Manus again. We've got science from all the different biomes, so there's no real point lugging it around any further. We didn't actually get any science, because it turns out you have to crash them pretty close to the seismometers, and also with quite a lot of impact energy for you to get any science from them whatsoever. Um, but, oh well, it doesn't really matter. It was either that or just ditch it in orbit. And at this point, um, this is when I learned, thanks to quite a few comments on previous videos, that you can time warp while firing engines from KSB Interstellar. That would have been really nice to know a few episodes ago, and even at the end of the previous series, when we had the massive long burn of <laughs> the endurance to send it to another star. You you have persistent thrust through time warp with all the interstellar engines, apparently. Um, well, this is complete news to me, and a few of you pointed it out in the comments. Thank you so much, because that is going to save me a lot of time during the rest of this series, and certainly when we start doing uh, burns towards another star once again, about halfway through this series, because we've only got this mission and our mission out to Jewel, our morning star mission, and once they're back home, we're going to be sending a mission to another star. We should have more than enough science to have unlocked uh, the Daedalus Drive, which is what we're aiming for. So, uh, yeah, good thing I found that out now rather than later. So, you see, we actually made two passes, but now I'm back home. I only have a single monitor, so I forgot to turn the recording back on. So you only saw one pass, but I assure you, you made two passes to bring our orbit down and get us into a low orbit around the wasteland, because now we're going to send our crew down to the Akira a base that we landed in the previous episode because of course we landed it uh, using a combination of parachutes and engines and now we need to send the crew down using this SSTO the sovereign SSTO piloted once again by Lemor so as I said you can expect some more daredevil maneuvers from him a little later on now the wasteland has got a much thinner atmosphere uh, than it used to. Of course, it used to be a, you know, one atmosphere thick. I believe now it's 0.4 atmospheres. Uh, it's either 0.4 or 0.6, something around that. Um, but it does actually still have quite a bit of oxygen in the atmosphere. It's still roughly 20% oxygen because no, well, there's no life to breathe it anymore. So though the whole atmosphere has gradually been stripped away and it is now predominantly carbon dioxide, there is still a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, meaning we can use jet engines. I did consider um, having to actually use fusion powered engines and just pass the intake atmosphere through um, one of the smaller fusion reactors and use that to propel our spacecraft, but that's pretty damn heavy. So if you can get away with using, um, few, not well, get away with using normal jet engines, uh, it saves you a lot of effort. It also saves you a lot of testing um, and also a lot of danger because fusion engines they introduce a lot of their own complications with the cooling and the offset center of mass and everything. So it's just much simpler to be able to add on a bit of extra fuel and just use good old fashioned jet engines and of course a pair of Sabre engines for when we want to head back up into orbit. However, the problem with having a very thin atmosphere like this is that in order to generate lift, we need to be traveling pretty fast, which means we need to land around about uh, 150 meters per second. So uh, this took a few attempts, but this time we sort of managed to power slide to a stop and bring down our velocity. And it's certainly gonna make our takeoff uh, a little later in the episode <laughs> quite exciting. But uh, yeah, it took a couple of attempts. I think this was about attempt six to get the aircraft down in one piece because the surface is not particularly flat either. So one bump at <laughs> about 200 meters per second and goodbye SSTO. So we landed a couple of kilometers away. So all we have to do is drive the base over to it so that we can transfer our crew and get them safe and sound into our 
wonderful mobile base where they will be spending the next couple of years. So although Lemor has piloted them all down to the surface, he's not actually a member of the crew. The crew is consisting of Ben Kerman, who is our engineer, who we're just getting out now. He is the mission leader. He's one of our four original badass Kerbals, if you remember, uh, and he's going to be looking after the base. He already has extensive experience. I mean, he was the uh, mission commander for the Artemis base for quite a few years, actually, so he certainly knows what he's doing. Next, we've got Ermol Kerman, who's actually our pilot, so he's going to be piloting the rover and also, it's quite important to have him in order to do USI's planetary logistics. You need to have a pilot or a quartermaster. Next, we had Podwig Kerman, one of our scientists. And last, but no, by no means least, we have Derna Kerman, our second scientist. So a crew of four, and we have perfectly balanced the life support of this mobile base for these four Kerbals. Um, but we'll get more onto that a little later on. First, we need to uh, make the base look a little better by removing all the various redundant parts that we use to land it on the surface. So all these big fuel tanks, all the parachutes, all the monopropellant, all the RCS thrusters, all of it needs to go. Try and reduce the weight because uh, later we're going to be climbing this whole base up a mountain. So uh, yeah, we need to try and reduce the weight as much as possible and also keep the part count down in order to keep the frames per second at a manageable level. It's got, uh, I believe, about 150 parts on it, this base. It's, uh, yeah, I was really quite happy with how we managed to compact everything we needed down. I mean, well, you might not agree that it's compacted down. It is quite a, uh, <laughs> it is quite a long base, uh, but this was the smallest I could possibly make a base uh, in order for it to fulfill all of our needs. But we will get on to the resources it requires and what it can produce a little later on. For now, though, we're just going to uh, withdraw the ladder and turn on all our various different parts of the base. We just need to turn on our life support recyclers, reduce the load on our supplies, turn on our agroponics bays, and start the habitation multipliers of those observation cupolas. Now, of course, we need to send... Lemo back up into orbit. This took a few more attempts. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I think it took about seven or eight attempts in order to get this thing off the ground. We need to get to almost 200 meters per second in order to take off, and this ground is very unforgiving. You see, we just get into the air by the skin of our teeth. Uh, <laughs> bit of a hop, skip, and a jump. But once we're in the air, we're absolutely fine, and uh, using the ramjets that we are using, the faster we go, the more thrust they produce, and the easier it gets. So once we've managed to get ourselves into the air uh, in a bit of a janky way we can uh, pretty much just cruise without any issues just having a look at the ruined Kerbal Space Center there we'll be getting a closer look at that later on so we're just skipping forward a little bit propelling ourselves into the upper atmosphere now once our engines start to overheat we're just gonna get as much velocity as we can inside the atmosphere and then we're going to switch off those air breathing engines close the intakes and switch over the Saber engines to a closed cycle rocket mode Hopefully the real lifesaver engine is going to, uh, you know, be finished sometime soon. I believe it was this year, actually, they finally managed to finish the pre-cooler. They tested it successfully uh, over 10 times in a row. So it's certainly looking promising, but uh, I do kind of fear that the Skylon is going to come a little bit too little too late because the cost to launch things per kilogram using Skylon, even though it is, a, is an SSTO, is actually considerably more than SpaceX's Starship, and it's looking like SpaceX is, SpaceX is going to finish Starship well before Skylon's anywhere near completed, so uh, it doesn't really look like the Sabre engine is going to get much use in the near future, but uh, still, a remarkable achievement. And uh, Reaction Engine Limited, one of the companies I'm hoping to work for when I finish my master's degree, so, you know, you never know. Try and ignore the uh, little overheating glitch we're getting there on the engine, I did ask Games Links and he tried to fix it. We tried a few different things. In the end, I just had to turn ignore max temperature, um, the ignore max temperature cheat on because for some reason at a certain altitude, only when you're in orbit, not when you're suborbital, but only when you're actually in a stable orbit between, I think it was 50,000 and 60,000 or something, um, for some reason the engines just start flickering as you see there. Um, and overheating and exploding. It's a little bit annoying, uh, but after a little while it goes away, so uh, yeah, just don't worry too much about it. We actually launched pretty much perfectly, and all we had to do was wait one orbit, do a tiny little maneuver, and we've brought ourselves back to Constellation spacecraft really very efficiently. And you see that massive fuel tank there, uh, just ahead of those spherical fuel tanks. That is just fuel for this spacecraft. So of course we had it without any fuel on board while we were still um, 
moving the constellation about because we didn't want to shift the center of mass to the side and induce a torque every time we fired the main engine. But uh, then we fueled it up in order to do this first mission and it's just got enough fuel to head down to the surface and head back up again one more time. And I think we pretty much put the perfect amount of fuel on this thing because they see there we're almost running on fumes but uh, we had more than enough to get ourselves rather comfortably into orbit. So uh, I think I've designed this spacecraft really rather well. Re <laughs> it just makes me so happy when you have to design these massive missions so far in advance, design everything to work and then you actually get it out there and it all just works flawlessly. It really is the best feeling. It's one of the greatest feelings of Kerbal Space Program. Of course, you have to put so many hours in designing all of this stuff in the first place, um, which is a little bit of a pain. But as I said, when it all works out, it really does make all of it worth it. So what we're going to do here is we've just got... Uh, Ben out. Oh, no, is this Ben? No, this might actually be Podwig, one of our scientists. Either Podwig or Derna. I don't know. The preview window is very low resolution. But we can actually stick out one of the new scientific instruments, which is uh, an actual weather station, because the wasteland has an atmosphere. We haven't managed to use these before, because we've only put uh, the breaking ground science down on airless bodies, so it's a little bit exciting for me. Yeah, there we go. And now we get Ben out, because we need to place some RTGs in order to power this. We could have used solar panels, but then, of course, they only would have been powered for one uh, one day at a time and they wouldn't have lasted through the night and we want to be getting data 24 7 so you see here we're just checking and yeah we do actually need two of those RTGs but we have plenty to spare now I know that you get massively diminishing returns setting up multiple science stations across the surface of uh, of anybody but we had the cargo space so they didn't really require much mass either uh, so we're going to be setting one up in every single biome just to try and get as much science as we can so we just get everyone back into the vehicle and then we as well as processing all the science now need to plan where we're going to go next now the first thing i thought was to head straight to the kerbal space center but I kind of want to set up base there, uh, deploy our inflatable modules, and then leave the base there. But before we can do that, we need to actually gather a stockpile of resources. So in order to make this base actually self-sufficient on supplies, we need three resources. We need substrate, we need gypsum, and we need hydrates. Now, the most important thing is hydrates. And hydrates can only be found in the mountain regions of the wasteland, the area where it's cool enough that ice that was previously you know, ice and snow previously uh, laying on the top of the mountains still have some deposits uh, buried beneath the surface. So that means we need to make our way up this massive mountain on wheels. Yeah, this took uh, this took quite a while and the most painful thing was uh, every time I damaged the wheels having to get Ben Kerman out to <laughs> go and repair all of them. But uh, on our way up we do actually go through a second biome. So we started in the sweltering Midlands. Now we're in the Charring Upper Midlands. I don't, I don't really know why there are Midlands and Upper Midlands. You'd think there would just be Lowlands, Midlands and Highlands, but no, it's, it's, it's Midlands, Upper Midlands and Peaks. I don't know, I'm not going to question the almighty Games Links <laughs> in his eternal wisdom, uh, but the biome names are a little bit confusing, but uh, let's not put too much thought into it. We deploy ourselves another science station and we continue onwards towards the peak. Now I did really want to visit one of our probes from uh, one of our previous missions, I believe it was the Tribute mission, um, and actually visit that sort of akin to Apollo 12 and how it visited Surveyors 3 on the surface of the moon, because it's kind of cool to you know, visit previous probes you've sent to places in person but uh, it gets to a point where the terrain gets so steep and it took so long to get up even this section of the mountain that uh, yeah I just decided it wasn't gonna happen it would just take too long so it would have been nice to visit one of the tribute probes actually in person and get a look at it but uh, we're not actually going to be doing that maybe at some future date um, we'll come and have a look but uh, we get onto this sort of plateau which is in the peaks biome and I decide this is where we're going to set up our temporary camp so what we do is we deploy well first of all doing a scan we have done orbital scans before uh, to find out the sort of generic resource distribution but we're doing the surface scans to get a more detailed idea of where all the resources are we deploy our drill and we start digging for hydrates so what we're going to do 
as well as deploying a high altitude weather station here is we're just going to stay here for uh, quite a few days and build up a stockpile of hydrates because of course using the USI modular colonization system we have access to planetary stockpiles which is why we have our pilot and that sort of module there just behind the bigger module with the uh, spinning thing on top of it and the aquaponics on the side that is a logistics module allowing us to put resources into a planetary stockpile so you just saw there we've dumped quite a few thousand units of hydrates into a planetary stockpile which we can then take out for a small cost at any time and then all we need to do is build up a similar stockpile of substrate and gypsum both of which are actually located back down in the upper midlands biome so once we get down there we just slam on the brakes deploy both of our drills and get digging because of course each of these medium sized drills has got three separate drill heads that can dig for different resources so we've got two drill heads dedicated to each of the three resources we need to dig for. We probably should have put some more radiators on this uh, mobile base because we did actually have some overheating issues with the drills during the day but during the night time they managed to get to their optimum digging temperature and we managed to dig quite a large stockpile of resources enough stockpile to last on the surface for a couple of years. So now we have all the necessary resources that we need, we can head over to the Kerbal Space Center or, well, what remains of it. I'm just getting some looks uh, from the inside of some of the modules there because some of you have asked for that in the past just to have a look at what it all looks like from the Kerbal's point of view and really it does look pretty cool. I'm quite happy with how the front and the cockpit of this uh, base actually turned out, sort of combining the new Mark II lander can sort of rover variant and one of the b9 overview cockpits i think it really turned out quite nicely and there it is the ruined kerbal space center a monument to the fall of kerbal kind a monument to all your sins I Sorry, I've been playing far too much Halo recently, <laughs> ever since Reach came to the Master Chief Collection and has been put onto Steam. That's been taking up quite a large portion of my life, which is, uh, well, probably why you haven't been seeing so many videos recently. As well as uh, I have actually been dealing with some pretty significant personal tragedy recently, but you guys all tend to be really rather understanding of that sort of thing. So now we get to the Kerbal Space Center, we can start taking some scientific readings because each of the buildings actually counts as a separate biome. So we're just going to get all our readings from the runway. I'm not going to go to all the different buildings and get readings from each of them because that would be a little bit scummy to uh, to use each different building as a separate biome and get a ridiculous amount of science from all of them. Um, I'm just going to treat the runway as one biome and just treat that as if that's the KSC biome and just get science from that. I think that's fair enough uh, just to sort of use it as one extra biome and not actually <laughs> sort of cheat science out of all of them because if the KSC wasn't here you wouldn't be able to do this. But uh, imagine it's just sort of examining the wreckage of the KSC and how the environment has weathered it over time. So now we have all of our scientific readings and we've actually filled the advanced science lab with data which is quite an impressive thing it has about 9500 capacity for data we can actually set up a semi-permanent camp you see the flag that we planted here on our previous mission to the wasteland which was uh, the phoenix lander uh, that, that mission, it went alright, but considering we had to ditch the phoenix on ascent, uh, I'm pretty sure that this mission has been a lot better organized. So now we can deploy our inflatable modules. First a deployable greenhouse and then a deployable habitat to extend the habitation time and make this base fully self-sufficient on supplies. You can see there these kerbals can stay here for two and a half years and our transfer window back to solitude is actually in about a year and a half. So that's when they're going to be heading back up to Constellation. But you can see there after we've activated all of our water processes and our greenhouse we are exactly self-sufficient on supplies it's plus 0, 0.000 supplies per second so we are now set to stay here for a few years researching the ruins of Kerbal Kind. And in the next episode we will be going to our morning star mission to Jewel and all that that entails. Thank you for watching I've been the Biddy Penguin and I'll see you all next time.